Well, good evening, Lebanon. Man, it is good to be back with you once again. And uh, man, I do say this from the bottom of my heart. Um, this place over the last several years has been a place. Um, that we come every now and then. No, it's been, a, it's been a wonderful place. You guys have been so supportive of our ministry uh, and have become dear friends. So just really grateful to be able to be with you this evening. And over the next few days, I hope to really serve you and stoke your heart a little bit towards this idea of church planning. So greetings uh, from the deep south all the way down in the city of Atlanta uh, to you folks way up here, you northerners up here. Um, Man, we are excited to be here. My wife, Trisha, as Brian said, is with us. And then uh, six of our children are here. We have two more, uh, one in college and one at a soccer game tonight. Uh, but we are so grateful to be here at Lebanon. Um, there's kind of a joke. I get the opportunity to work with a lot of church planners. And there is this kind of running line among church planners that every church planner believes that they are planting in the hardest place imaginable. Now, now, I'm not going to make that apologetic for the city of Atlanta. I'm just not going to, because it's not really realistic. However, uh, I'm going to try to make an argument this evening from the text why we should be involved in church planting. But before I get there, I do want to say, why Atlanta? And I'm going to give you two reasons. Just These are not biblical. These are just practical reasons why we should be concerned about church planning, particularly in the city of Atlanta. I think the first reason is simply this, because proximity breeds responsibility. Uh, doesn't it say in the scripture that like, if you see your brother who's in need, then it's kind of upon you, it's incumbent upon you to meet that need if you are able. And here we are in the city of Atlanta, and if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, in one sense, folks, right on your doorstep, you owe them the gospel in one sense. We owe our city in one sense, compassion and care and Christ-like burden. So I would say that is one reason why every person in this room who lives in the metro Atlanta area should have a burden for this great city of Atlanta because it is right here. It is where we live and God has brought that opportunity to our doorstep. The second thing is just idea of it has a strategic value. Global cities like Atlanta is fastly becoming, it's been known, it's been called the capital of the New South, have a disproportionate influence on our culture and on the culture of the world. And so maybe there are areas across the globe with greater need. That's true. I don't dispute that at all. There are unreached people groups that need the gospel far more than Atlanta needs it. And yet there is strategic value to church planning in Atlanta because Atlanta has exorbitant influence on the rest of the world. In other words, if we can influence Atlanta, we can influence the world through Atlanta. So there's just some practical ideas. I'm going to talk about church planning in general, but I want you to have that in the back of your mind, church planning in particular in this city of Atlanta that God has blessed us all to live in. So let's pray and then let's look at God's word together. Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to hear from you today. And I pray in some small way you would nudge us towards your perspective. Give us your heart, give us your vision, or break us for what breaks you, motivate us in ways that motivate you, and by your grace, empower us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At Gospel Hope, we conclude every service with what we call a missional benediction. We're going to put it up on the screen right now. Now, when we say this at the end of every service, we say, Gospel Hope, you are, and I point, and they say what? Sent. Okay, you guys are not very good at it. So let's try, Brian, what is your problem? Where's the leadership here? Gospel Hope, or I should say, Lebanon, you are? Sent. Lebanon, you are? Sent. Why do we do that? Why don't we just read a passage of scripture or something like that, or something a little more traditional? Well, the reason is rooted in this idea that I believe that this is a biblical conviction, that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called by him to participate in his mission. The Bible consistently emphasizes this principle. Mark 
or Matthew chapter 10, verse number 16, Jesus speaking, look, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse number 20. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us or in the words of the savior as he was getting ready to leave his disciples as the father has sent me, I also send you. To put it very plainly, Jesus not only saves, he sends. Sometimes we look at Jesus as our savior and rightfully so, but Jesus is also the great and eternal sender. This is part of your blood-bought identity as a follower of Christ. Just as the Father sent Jesus into the world to complete his mission, so now Jesus has sent us into the world to complete the work that his Father has given to us. We conclude our services at Gospel Hope with you are sent to remind us of who we are. So we all have spiritual amnesia, do we not? I tend to forget that I am an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I am a sent one of the risen and conquering Savior himself. I have been saved so that I may go, so that I might be sent into the harvest fields. Suppose, any car guys in here, any car peoples in here? All right. Suppose you were driving down the road one day and you saw just this abandoned classic car. I mean, just a real beauty, but it was in complete disrepair. So you did all the work to purchase that car, procure it, you towed it back to the garage and you began the meticulous, painstaking work of bringing that thing back to original. And after months or maybe even years of work, it was bright and shiny. It was perfect. And then at that moment, you took that car, hooked it up to the tow vehicle once again, and put it right back in that field. You would say, that's utterly ridiculous. That's utterly ridiculous because that car was restored for a purpose. You restored that car in order to drive it or to showcase it. You didn't just bring it back from the dead, so to speak, to put it back where it belongs. And I would argue the same thing. If you believe the gospel, you have been saved from something and you have been saved for something. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 through 10, we often give emphasis to the first part of these verses, but we need not forget the second part of the verse as well. For you are saved by grace, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, look carefully, not by works so that no one can boast. So we often say, praise the Lord, we are saved by grace, through faith, that is not our works, and all God's people said what? But there is a verse 10 that also says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We have been saved by grace, amen? Through faith, amen? For works, amen? By grace, through faith, for works. In other words, when God rescues you, he rescues you for a purpose. And a big part of that purpose that God rescues you for is to get you involved in his mission in the world. Which leads me to my point this evening, simply this, we must live sent. We must live sent. That is what we are. But if we are to live sent lives, both as individuals and as a church collectively, there are certain laws, I would argue, that we must reckon with. These are laws like the law of gravity or the second law of thermodynamics, just things woven into the warp and woof of sending. In other words, if you are going to send, these principles are part of sending and you cannot escape them. They are part of what it means to live a life as an individual sent by God and part of what it means to live as a church that Lebanon desperately desires to do that is sent by God. So I want to just outline very briefly tonight two laws of sending. Law number one is this, sending is risky. 
In this passage, Jesus uses a powerful analogy to help us get this point. John chapter 12, verse number 24. We'll just be looking at one verse. Truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. In our modern, industrial, convenient society, where everything is at the press of the button and easy for us to access, it can be tempting for us to forget that agriculture, farming, is a very risky business. Think about it for a moment. When you plant a seed in the ground, so imagine yourself as having some grain in your hand. When you plant that seed in the ground, what are you doing? You are functionally letting go of sustenance that you have in the hopes that it will produce more sustenance in the future. So you're letting go of the sure thing in the hope that it will bring you more of that sure thing in the future. Every time, in a sense, that you send, you release a seed, it costs you something very significant. Security, peace of mind, the next day's bread, it costs you something significant. As Jesus prepared to go to the cross, although as the omniscient Son of God, he knew what was on the other side, he also recognized that completing the mission his father had sent him on would be a costly endeavor. Sometimes individual believers or churches can catch what I would call the sending bug. Maybe they read a book. Maybe they go to a conference. Maybe they hear a great sermon or spend time with a church planner and suddenly they're saying, let's be all about sending. Let's send, 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 let's send, let's woo, send. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that's fantastic. And I believe in part, this is what your pastors desired when they, when they planned this missions emphasis weekend, Moo. It's a terrible acronym, guys. Their only strategic blunder was their speaker choice. I mean, come on, guys. Don't you know some other people? Seriously. However, in our excitement around sending, yes, let's send. We cannot forget there is an intrinsic cost to sending. Or to put it very plainly, sending involves sacrifice. Every time. Every time. When the father sent the son, was it a sacrifice? Yes or no? Absolutely. When the church at Antioch sent out Paul and Barnabas, probably their two best leaders, was it a sacrifice? Yes or no? Yes. When Lebanon Baptist Church sent out the Sprites, was that not a sacrifice? Yes. When you release people, when you release the seed from your hand in one sense, ooh, that's a trip hazard. It is a call for a sacrifice. But for multiplication to happen, we must always be willing, like the Father did, to release the seed in one sense. In um, Gospel Hope's short history, um, man, I'm really grateful for this. We have had the privilege to be able to send out several families. And let me let you in on a little secret. This maybe is not rocket science, but sometimes we miss this idea. The type of people that are willing to go and be a church planner or a missionary are not typically the type of people you love to lose. These are not people that you're like, yep, okay, we'll see you later, good riddance. Now, some of you, I spoke to Pastor Brian, and he gave me a list of people, I have it here, that he would love to see go plant a church. So if your name is on this list, please stand. Um, I'm just kidding. But seriously, stop and think about it. When you send somebody out, what type of person is that? That is a type of person that's a disciple maker. They're a leader. They're usually a giver. They are willing to be at things. They serve. They're active. But what sending does is it costs. It calls us to let the seed out of our hands. In a sense, every time we are saying, every time we send, we are essentially saying, God, 
we, po we put both these people that we love and the future of our church in your hands. We're trusting you because when you release people like that, that's not easy to do. There's a sacrifice incumbent on that. And you begin to say, man, if we send out this person, what are we going to do? How are we going to make it? But I want us to go into this Lebanon thinking about, man, sending is intrinsically costly. It demands sacrifices of us. Or if I could put it another way, sending, like sowing, is an act of faith. You are releasing that seed in faith. Each act of sending is a declaration of our trust in God. When you send out somebody, you're saying, Lord, we trust you. We don't know how we're going to fill this gap. We don't know what we're going to do, but God, we trust you. So we really have two options. We can strive to keep our future in our own hands and hang on to our people and hang on to our resources and have a closed heart towards sending or we can create a culture of sending by encouraging our best and our brightest to go in, in place and place ourselves in the hands of the one the Bible says who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. Sending is a little bit trendy. Sending is a little bit glamorous right now. But I want to remind us that sending is a risk every single time. Because unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But number two, sending is not only risky, sending is rewarding. Thus far, I've basically only given you the bad news of sending, but there's also incredibly good news about sending. Let's return to Jesus' words. Truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But... If it dies, it produces much fruit. You see, though, letting the seed go is certainly costly in the moment. In the long run, it pays great dividends. And obviously, this is preeminently demonstrated in the work of the Savior. Jesus, by his atoning death, fulfilled his mission. He laid down his life and died. And as a result, he produced much fruit. And what did he do? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. He brought many sons and daughters to glory. He multiplied in one sense. And by laying down his life, he purchased people for God by his blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. To summarize, what did Jesus do? Jesus gained by losing. And I would argue the same principle is true for us. But it's not an easy principle. In the church, there is an impulse for us to try to hang on, to keep our people together in a holy huddle, enjoy the sweet fellowship that the Lord has entrusted to us. Now, there's an aspect of this that is good and right. We should love people in our church. We should. Like, we should desire to be with people in our church. If you don't desire to be with people in your church, ooh, except Mark. I mean, nobody's going to be upset if you don't like Mark. That's fine. That's fine. Other people in the church, we should desire to be with them. And yet, we cannot desire to be with them so much that we're unwilling to release them. Because when we fail to do so, desire to hang on to people is actually counterproductive to our calling. Here's why. About 40% of the world's population, 3.23 billion, live in unreached people groups. These are not just unsaved people, but these are people with zero access to the gospel. In other words, if no one is sent to them, they will not only not be saved, but they will not even have the opportunity to hear. So we must send, we must have a culture and a heart of sending because the need of the nations demands it. Not only that, Metro Atlanta is growing exponentially and all people with a driver's license said, that was less than enthusiastic. You know, our city is projected to grow approximately by 3 million people in the next 30 years. 
An ideal ratio of churches to population is about one church for every 1,000 people. Just to keep pace, therefore, with population growth, this has nothing to do with what's already going on, but just to keep pace with the 3,000 people that, or 3 million people that are coming to Atlanta, that would mean that we need to plant about 3,000 new churches. In addition to this, new churches are about six to eight times more effective in reaching new people than existing churches. That's, that's not six to eight percent. That's 600 to 800 percent more effective in reaching new people and unchurched people than existing churches. That is statistically the most effective way to reach unchurched and dechurched people without question is to start as many new churches as you possibly can. As pastor theologian Tim Keller put it, the vigorous continual planning of new congregations is the single most crucial strategy for any numerical growth of the body of Christ in a city and the continual corporate renewal and revival of the existing churches in the city. Let me put a pin in that right there. Did you catch that? Church planning not only helps reach new people, it actually helps existing churches. Sometimes we think of the idea of new churches are going to hurt existing churches. No, they actually help existing churches because they remind existing churches of what the need is and that we're not just vying for a limited slice of the pie. We're trying to expand the pie by helping more people come to see and know Jesus. Nothing else. Follow along with this. Not crusades. Outreach programs, parachurch ministries, growing megachurches, congregational consulting, nor church renewal processes will have the consistent impact of dynamic, extensive church planting. L listen to this last statement. This is an eyebrow-raising statement, but to those who have done any study at all, it is not even controversial. In other words, if we really want to see people saved in our city, we need to be about the business of planting churches. Statistically and research-driven, it is the most effective means of reaching our city, more than any other method that exists out there. That should control how we think about our budgets and our giving and, our, and the time that we spend in our churches. What we should leverage everything that we have in order to see the most people reached. And the way to do that is to be involved in church planting. So as Pastor J.D. Greer suggests, perhaps we need to change our approach to value sending capacity over seating capacity. A few weeks ago, Tricia and I had the most wonderful opportunity to be present for our church plant that we just launched in Santo Domingo called Ciudad de Gracia, City of Grace. This was an extremely gratifying experience because the Lord used our little new church to start another little new church. Our toddler church had a baby church. I don't know how you do that with the you know, biology and stuff like that, but that's what happened. And this group of, of leaders and pastors is reaching a group of people that we could never touch. I mean, I was sitting in that room and it was, it was somewhat overwhelming to me. And then a bit of kingdom mathematics hit me. I'm a bit of a nerd, so please bear with me here. My dad was a math teacher and so it's in the blood. Um, so. Let me use a little bit of a visual analogy here, and this might flop, but bear with me, okay? If it does, it's all right. I'll speak again tomorrow, and it'll be better. All right. So let's say, let's say this row right here, this row right here. Well, not you, Garrett. Garrett, right? Okay, not you, Garrett. These three right here. You guys represent Lebanon Baptist, current state. So could you stand up there? Lebanon Baptist, current state. So, you know, about, about 100 per people per person. That's kind of our legend right now. And, and, and let's say in the next year, next five years, praise the Lord, Lebanon Baptist grows by a third. So now, Garrett, you can, you can be a part. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Amen. Man, to see like a third more people in there, that'd be awesome. Praise God. So that's five years. But let's say in that same time, okay, Lebanon Baptist, by God's grace, plants two churches. It's a little ambitious, but 
You guys can do it. Say you send out two church planners. So here's some, here's some aspiring church planners right here. Ladies, stand up. Okay. So here we have five years from now, Lebanon Baptist has grown and they've got some church planners out there. Amen? Wouldn't this be good? Great. Five years more. Let's go on. You want to be part of the church? Come on. All right. Lebanon. Lebanon. I mean, man, those guys are good. Yeah, they keep growing. Reaching more people in their community. That's fantastic. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Okay, so five years. Let, let's, even, let's even be auspicious here. We grow, we grow even more here. All right, man. I mean, Lebanon's getting the job done. But in those next five years, they've also planted two more churches. So over here, uh, who, who looks like some church planters over here? I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little bit back. How, how about you guys right here? You guys are church planters. So two, two new church plants. And these guys have been working really hard during that time. And so guess what they did? Well, they reached some people. So how about you, you two right here? Well, that's awesome. Five more years. Lebanon does it again. I mean, these people are playing the hits right now. They just keep going. So, okay, all right, right here. Come, Sydney, Peyton, you guys stand up. Another 200 people. Lebanon is becoming a mega church, folks. It is, it is starting to burst. You got six services going on the campus right now. It's incredible. It's incredible. And in those five years, guess what they did? Well, they, they planted two more churches back over here. Okay, so you guys, can you be church planners? Fantastic. And these guys, I mean, they're still getting the job done, right? So they reach two more people, okay, right? And, and, now, and now these new churches that they planted, they also reached two people. And that way, you guys just got planted. You haven't had time to reach anybody yet, okay. <laughs> but these guys, you guys were planted already, right? And they reached two more people, okay. All right, what are you starting to see here? In time, what's going to happen? Are there more people worshiping at Lebanon Baptist or people that have been sent out of Lebanon Baptist worshiping not at Lebanon Baptist? Do you see? Okay, do I need to do it again? Because you guys are not like, you're not persuaded by this. Okay. The scales are starting to tip. Even though Lebanon is growing and vibrant, church planning is actually reaching more people. These aren't big churches. These are just multiplying churches. This is a big church. This is a bunch of little churches reaching a bunch of people. Okay, everybody can sit down. Here's the idea of kingdom mathematics that I'm trying to get at. Multiplication beats addition every time. Multiplication beats addition every time. Huh. But let's not forget in the midst of all that. Man, my desire is that in short order, there are more people worshiping who have been sent out of gospel hope than are worshiping at gospel hope. Like I want our sending capacity to be greater than our seating capacity. I want to measure success by actually sending people out into the harvest fields versus just having a bigger church. We need to begin to say, what is our goal? Our goal is to reach as many people as possible, not just simply to have a nice big church. Now, I'm all for Lebanon. Man, I think the community is served in Roswell if Lebanon is a strong, vibrant, big church. I think your pastors are great. I think you folks are great. I hope there aren't seats left pretty soon. I do. I pray all of those things are true. But I do want to say, if we really want to make an impact in our city, it's going to take more than just a few big churches. It's going to take us multiplying the gospel and being willing to send even some of our best and brightest into the harvest fields. But let us not forget to reap the harvest. Guess what? You got to sow the seed. You will never reap a harvest if you don't sow the seed. You've got to release You've got to die. You've got to follow in the steps of our Lord Jesus and say, man, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it will remain alone. But, but if it dies, it will bear much fruit. We've got to be more about the name of Jesus than we are about the name of Lebanon Baptist. As much as we love Lebanon Baptist, we've got to say we want the kingdom of Christ, his kingdom come, not our kingdom come. And so that means we are laying down our lives on a regular basis. We are leveraging our time and our talents and our treasures and even some of our best friends and saying, Lord, if you want them, they're yours. If you want me, I'm yours. 
If you want me to pack up and move across the city and be a part of a church plant or start a church, Lord, I am yours because it is about your kingdom. So where does this leave us? Well, my hope is this message begins a shift in our thinking. And this is no shade on Lebanon. I love this church and I think it is so healthy. There are so many wonderful things about us. Uh, I, I, I've been blessed by our relationship with this church. But I want us to make sure that we're thinking about the church rightly. So I'm going to close with this by kind of offering three ideas about how we should, or, or three ideas about how we sometimes think about the church. Many people think about the church as a cruise ship. That is, it exists primarily for the comfort of the passengers. So the success of the church is evaluated based on whether or not I am happy, whether it has the programs that I want, whether the preaching and the worship meet my needs. When people think of the church in this way, church becomes about my preferences, even over Christ's mission. And I think instinctively we all know, well, no, the church shouldn't be like a cruise ship, like it's not just about my comforts, but you can see how this is a tempting thing. In our consumeristic society, we can think that even the church should be existing really to just make me feel comfortable, make me feel happy. So I would, I would say a better analogy is that the church should be viewed as a battleship. Now this is an improvement where the primary purpose of the, the battleship is to take the fight to the enemy. This is certainly a, a better version as churches are sometimes called to storm the gates of hell as Jesus calls us to. However, there's a slight problem with this image as it places too much emphasis on the church organization owning the mission. In other words, it's the pastors, the, the person in the captain's chair who really has the authority. And wherever they say, that's where the church goes, and they're giving the orders, they're firing the guns. It's better, but I think an even better analogy is this. We should view the church as an aircraft carrier. In this way, the Sunday gathering, the times that we get together in our groups, the, we are gathering together, it's a place where our fighter pilots are fueled up and sent out to take the fight to the enemy. I think that's really what we're doing here this evening. Th this, this purpose of this gathering is one sense is to fuel you up so you can go out and really begin the ministry. This is our equipping time. This is our edifying time while so that we can all go out and engage in the mission far better than we can do it inside the walls here. The church gathered is really important, but also is the church scattered. So I think our conceptualization should be, man, I come to the church. Yes, this building is a blessing. It's a wonderful tool that God has given. I come so that I can be fueled up, but I don't just sit here to say, scratch my itches and make me feel good about myself. I am preparing to go out in the battle. So my hope is to be fueled up so I can take the fight to the gates of hell, so I can take the fight to the enemy. And if that's in Marietta, praise the Lord. If it's in Peachtree City, praise the Lord. If it's in downtown in the old fourth ward, praise the Lord. Wherever God may send you, we are saying, Lord, we are being filled up and fueled up so that we can be sent out. I think that's how we should think of the church as a aircraft carrier that is helping us to take the battle to the very devil's territory. My desire is that in one sense, this would be a decisive moment and that, that this church as a whole would say, you know what, we are committed as hard as it may be to sending even some of our best, even some of our brightest and sending them out because we want the kingdom of Christ to be exalted. God may not be calling you to cross the ocean or to plant a church. He may be. But God is inviting all of us to get involved in his mission in some way. May it be true that of every member of Lebanon Baptist Church that we embrace this reality. We both send and we are sent. Both of those things are true of every follower of Jesus. We both send and we are sent by the Lord into his ministry. Here's what I want to do here tonight, real briefly. Um, let's have that last slide up there. I'd like you just to have a brief conversation with some folks sitting around you, just real brief. We're gonna give you about three minutes here. And here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna ask these questions. What, what risk of sending is difficult for you to embrace? 
And then secondly, how can you cultivate a confidence in the reward of sending? Now, if you just talk about that for a second, um, then I'd like you to, somebody in the group, just pray for one another. So just have a brief conversation about this. What risk of sending is difficult to embrace? How can you cultivate a confidence in the reward of sending? And then have, have somebody pray. Do we got that? Okay, then after that, one of the pastors is going to come up and close. Ready, set, go. Thank <laughs> you.